Well, good morning and welcome to Sunday School this morning. We're going to talk about the Sea of Galilee a little bit. And before we get started, uh, we'll have a prayer. And then after the class is finished, we'll uh, turn the microphone off. If you want to ask any additional questions, you won't be on the World Wide Web. Uh, but let's have a prayer first. Heavenly Father, thank you for a time to come to your house on a Sunday morning and a time to see old friends and new friends. I thank you for, um, for all who are here, and I pray that you bless us with your Holy Spirit. And this morning, I pray that you speak to us and let us find our place in your world. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you've got a Bible, I'd love for you to have one because I don't have a slide this morning. We're going to read from Mark chapter 5 in the 21st verse. It's on page 816 from the Bibles on the cart, page 816. Uh, but you just hold that. We're going to talk about the Sea of Galilee for just a minute. I mentioned this in a sermon last week, and it was just such a quick mention. And so many people were interested in this fact that I thought we would have a class on it. And there's a podcast that will be released tomorrow uh, with some of this stuff and then some, maybe some stuff I probably will forget to tell you today. Uh, it, ten miles, ten miles, half the Gospels happen. I'll, I'll say it this way. Half the Gospels happen in ten miles crazy, right? Just 10 miles. Now, I need, to, I need to sort of back up and explain that just a little bit. The first three Gospels are called the Synoptic Gospels, which means they're written with the same point of view, which means that 95% of Mark is in Matthew and Luke, so they're going to be told the same way. So these are the three where, where over half the Gospels take place in 10 miles. Uh, well, John's Gospel is different. While, while, while the first three take place mostly in Galilee and then go down to Jerusalem, for Jesus' death, John's gospel, most of it takes place in Jerusalem. It's an urban story. So it's, it's, this, it's the stories of, of Jesus in Jerusalem. Jesus didn't go to Jerusalem one time. As, a, as a, a, a practicing Jewish person, Jesus went to Jerusalem at least once for the, a year for the entirety of his life and three times if you could swing it. So Jerusalem would be a five days walk from, um, a five days walk from Galilee, which I'm going to show you in just a minute, about the same distance as, say, Birmingham to Montgomery. And they would travel down a really, really dusty, hot road called the, 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 the Jordan Rift Valley, which is the deepest crack on planet Earth. And then they would climb up the Jericho Road for the, for the worship. It was really a remarkable thing. The, the city of Jerusalem would swell from 35,000 people to a million for the festivals. It was crazy religion. I'm sure the Romans were scratching their heads at the whole thing. But in terms of daily life, okay, in terms of daily life, when Jesus was about 30 years old, he appears on the scene in Galilee and sets the world on fire. It's just, we just don't really appreciate the fact that it's only a 10-mile world. So Jesus did most of his ministry on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. I know you love these maps that I draw because I can't, I can't really find anything I like and I'm just too cheap and I figure I, you, you'll get it, right? Uh, Magdala, which is the, the far north, northwest corner, Magdala, where Mary Magdalene is from, and that's going to be important part of our story today. Magdala, uh, Capernaum is about right here in the middle. Bethsaida is on the other side of the Jordan River. And I'll, I'll show you a couple of slides. First of all, the Sea of Galilee is very pretty. It's the lowest freshwater lake on earth. It's 800 feet below sea level. So if you're into sea level things, it's really funky topography, which means that it sits in a bowl. Uh, that's not a mountain. That's just really just the, just the level land, and then it falls down into that because the Sea of Galilee is in that Jordan Rift Valley, that crack. Uh, it's, it's two tectonic plates that come together around Ethiopia and it runs all the way into Syria and it's just this, it's just this crack in the earth. When you're down by the Dead Sea, that's the lowest place on earth. So that's about 1,400 feet below sea level. This is 800 feet below sea level. And I took this picture just a couple weeks ago. I, I went with my son and, and I was standing about right here taking a picture across the way. At the, at the end of the day. So you're just kind of looking across. You can always see across to the other side. So when the Gospels would say, they came from the other side. They could always see the other side. It's only seven miles wide at its widest point. It's 11 miles long. I mean, you could, it's the same surface area, thanks to someone who works for Alabama Power, uh, told me that it's the same surface area as Lake Martin. So psh, there you go. Uh, so J Jesus loved the lake uh, like everybody else. And he did, he did, he did love the lake. Uh, next podcast will be about John chapter 21, which was, uh, has been a mystery for many people for a long time because it's after Easter and it's at the lake. And people say, well, what are they doing at the lake? Well, if you saw it, you get it, right? Of course, of course they went back to the lake. The lake is where they could think. The lake is where they could 
could regroup. The lake is where Jesus could speak to them. They could hear. I mean, if anybody's ever loved to be out in the woods or, or, or on water, I mean, of, cor of course they would leave the city and go back to the lake. It's, it's a beautiful lake. Uh, ten Mile Arc. The reason why, I'll give you the short answer. The reason why it's a ten mile arc on the northwest shore of the lake is because that's where the fish are. Uh, it's shallow up in there. Uh, the fish that, that Jesus' friends, the disciples, would catch, is, it's a native African tilapia. It's not the tilapia that you get at Publix from Greensboro, uh, but rather it's a, right, no, it's a little more robust fish uh, uh, because it has to be. It's, it's a native fish. Another thing I'll say about the Sea of Galilee, it's, um, it's an African lake so that uh, the flora and the fauna and the fish and the critters are all African critters, the jackals, and, and then the, you've got banana trees and date palms and that kind of stuff. However, if you were to travel one mile north of, um, excuse me, one hour north, excuse me, one hour north of the Sea of Galilee, uh, you would have on one side of the Jordan River uh, the tectonic or the, the continent of, of Europe and the other side the continent of Asia. So let's see if I can say this again. You're in Africa when you're in the Sea of Galilee, one hour's drive north. You're, or you've got Europe on one side and Asia on the other. Uh, my pal Edan and I were just sort of chitty-chatting about the crazy biodiversity of the place. And Edan even suggested, you know, we always think that perhaps God called his people in the Near East because it was the cradle of civilization. It's also possible that God called his people in the Near East because this is the one part of the world that touches three continents within just a few miles of each other. It's, it's a crazy, it is, it, is, it is a crazy place. Speaking of my pal Edan, he usually watches from Jerusalem this class, so he knows I'm talking about him. Uh, he'll be here next week. Uh, uh, let's see, yeah, yes, next week, not this week, but next week. So he will be here. He arrives on the 5th and preaches in Texas. And so the middle of the week, we're going to get to have him for a few things. I want to kind of tell you what we're doing. Uh, we will have him teach the men's Bible study, and all are welcome. People can bring their spouses if they want to come. That's from 7 to 8 in the morning. And then on Thursday night, we're going to have a, um, a teaching for the parish. You know, a lot of you would like to go to Israel. Maybe it's not a good time for you right now, and, and certainly just lots of reasons uh, why that might not be convenient for travel. So we want to bring it to you. So that'll be 6.30 Thursday night, not this week, but the next week. And my, my buddy will come and, and tell you some, some Galilee stories. That's what I asked him to do. So just, just sort of put that, on your, put that on your calendar, and we'll get him to come, come bring, bring the, the land of the Bible to, uh, to us. Okay, so that's where the fish are. The northwest shore of the lake, it's shallow up in there in this grass. I do know this because a few years ago I got to fish with some guys up there, and they fish the same way because it's a, an algae-eating fish. You have to catch them with nets. So it's either a cast net or a, or a gill net. You drop it, you let the fish swim through, and you catch it. You pull them up six hours later, just like the Bible says, right? Pull up your nets, cast out your nets, put your nets on the other side. I mean, it, it, the, Bible, the Bible describes exactly uh, the world uh, where they live. The reason why I tell you all this is because I, I, I'm trying to impart the fact that gospel stories are about real people with real jobs and real concerns, stuff that keeps them up at night, uh, real priorities. Uh, these, are not, these are not simply fairy tales from a long time ago and far, far away. There's still people living on this lake, uh, fishing for a living, uh, even in the midst of Christian pilgrims over there, you know, trying to find uh, traces of, of, of Jesus. You've got people sort of just going through the day to day. So someone asked me just a minute ago, what do you call this lake? We call it the Sea of Galilee. In, the, um, in Luke's gospel, he refers to it as Gennesaret, which is a Greek uh, form, if you will, Greek uh, translation of Kinneret. So the, the lake, and that's, that's the word for Galilee in Hebrew, the Sea of Galilee in Hebrew. So this, they call it Kinneret to this day. So that if you see Sea of Kinneret, Sea of Gennesaret, Sea of Galilee, it's all the same thing. And the reason why I have, have you open to Mark chapter 5, because I believe an iconic story happens here. If, 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 the gospel, if the Gospels remember real people with real lives in a real place, 10 miles on the northwest shore of the lake where the fish are, uh, then, then I believe this story um, should, should speak to us. All right, so I'm going to read it to you. It's really two stories in one. In Mark's Gospel, we, we call this a sandwich. It's where, it's where a story is sandwiched inside of another story. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. 
come lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And so he went with him. And we'll pause right there and say that the leader of the synagogue is a really, really important guy. So for this carpenter's son from Nazareth to command this kind of, this kind of honor, obeisance, what are you going to call it, is, is truly a remarkable. This is a remarkable. It gets right by us because it's Jesus, right? Of course he fell down. No, this is, this is really something for him to beg Jesus in this way and to be desperate for Jesus' help in this way. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and spent all that she had, and she was no better but rather grew worse. And she had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, for she said, but if I touch his clothes, I will be made well. And immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed from her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say who touched me? And he looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told, the whole tr- told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. And he put them all outside, and he took the child's father and mother who were with him and went in there where the child was. And he took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. And at this they were overcome with amazement. And he strictly ordered them that no one should know this, but he told her to give them something to eat. Well, as I mentioned, it's, just, it's two stories in one. And on one level, you could simply say this is a great example of Jesus' um, use of time management. I mean, the guy could be present with anybody, right, anywhere. He's got a crowd dragging him around, and then suddenly, right, he's following the leader of the synagogue, the most important guy in whichever village would be on this 10-mile arc. It's going to happen somewhere on, on this shore of the lake. And then suddenly a, a woman touches him and he feels power go forth from him, right? And, he, and he's present with her for a minute and then he goes back to heal the child. I want to con, consider that, that something a little more artistic. These are really the same story. So first of all, we're told that Jesus came from the other side. What had happened if we were reading Mark's gospel as a whole, we would have learned that a few verses before this story, Jesus had been on this side of the lake healing a man of, of demons in his mind. As a matter of fact, this picture is taken from where we believe the swine rushed headlong into the lake. So let me paraphrase the story so you can sort of get it in your head while you're looking at the picture. Uh, Jesus goes from this side of the lake where he's a rock star, where crowds follow him everywhere, and he goes out into the water and he gets caught in a storm. So he stills the storm with just a word. His disciples say, who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him, right? And he goes to this side of the lake, and there's a man with a thousand demons in his mind. And it's, it's a horror story because, one, the dude with a thousand demons in his mind is scary enough. He lives in the tombs, and tombs are unclean. They're, in the Hebrew, the Hebrew religion, if you will, it's very, very specific about, about burying quickly and being, and being ritually cleansed after, after burial. You, you didn't do dead things, you didn't do dead stuff. You know, the reason why you didn't do that is because they, they were in captivity in Egypt. Remember, remember that story from Exodus? When they were in captivity for Egypt for 400 years, the Egyptians were all about dead people. They're all about mummies and the king riding a boat into the afterlife and taking his dog and his slaves with him and feed him for a thousand years. They have hieroglyphics to tell you how it all works and what kind of jackal-headed God's going to meet you at the river and row you across, right, and all this stuff. And so, and so when God's people escape from Egypt, God gives them, talk about it t- today in, in, in our sermon, God gives them ten precepts. That's all, ten Ten ways to follow God. Four to follow, to be in union with God. Six to be in union with your neighbor. And just, just ten. Just put all that propaganda down. Put all that garbage down. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about. Don't worry about explaining the afterlife to the point uh, that you've, you've got that the king gets first class seats. You know when he crosses the river or whatever, whatever. Just go to sleep and trust in me. The, the earth is made for responsibility. The heaven is made. For, for mystery, and don't worry about it. You'll come home to me. They're very reticent 
about what happens on the other side of the grave because the Egyptians would tell you everything. However, all that said, within the laws of Moses, it would say tombs are unclean places. So they would whitewash them. Do you remember, do you remember a scene in, in the Gospels where Jesus calls the uh, Pharisees hypocrites and they like whitewashed tombs? That they look good on the outside, but inside they're full of all kinds of filth. Well, he's using something that they saw every day. They would whitewash them so that you wouldn't bump up against one, and then you'd have to quarantine for a week. <laughs> you know, I love to use that word quarantine because we know what that means now on the other side of COVID. I was, I was more afraid of quarantine than I was the virus, quite frankly. And so you, you, if you brush up against a tomb and you got unclean, you couldn't be around people for a while. I tell you this because he goes from this horror story. So remember the demons say, he says, what's your name? The demons say, Legion, for we're many. And so they beg for Jesus to throw them into the communal swine herd. There are no pigs on this side of the lake. The reason why we know that archaeologically that this is the Jewish side of the lake is by what they eat and what's found in the garbage pits. And so there are no pig bones here, but there are plenty over here. This is the Gentile side of the lake. Again, Jesus is a rock star here. Over here, nobody knows him except one scary dude. So the pigs enter the swine and fall headlong into the lake where we're looking right here. And everybody on the Gentile side of the lake wants him gone. They've lost their investment. The scary guy now is talking normal and is wearing clothes again and wants to go back to the city, you know, and tell people what Jesus has done for him. It's very disorienting, and so he goes back to the other side of the lake. And what I'm setting up for you is if you look at the Gospels as, as an artistic rendering, he's going from storm to storm to storm. He's going from this storm now back to the other side, verse 21. When Jesus crossed again in the boat to the other side, he's going back over here to another storm. And what's the storm? Well, the little girls died. That's a storm. I mean, that, that's, it, that's hard to comprehend, that kind, of, that kind of pain. If anybody of us, any of us have been through it, I, I saw something, gosh, just yesterday on the Internet. It said that if you don't understand my grief, then thank God you don't have to understand my grief. Right, that's 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 a horror show. So he's going from one horror show to another horror show. Jairus is so desperate he kneels at Jesus' feet. But then a woman touches him who's had a hemorrhage. Now, if scary dude with a thousand demons in his mind is scary to the is scary to the folks living on the Gentile side of the lake, this poor woman who's had a hemorrhage for twelve years is also a horror show for the people living in the ten mile arc where the fish are. She's a horror show because the Hebrew religion is very specific about blood. The word blood is dom in the Hebrew religion, in the Hebrew language rather, and, and the word means life, or it means life force. So they're very careful with blood. This is why they would, this is why they would put the blood of the lamb on the lintel over the, you know, over the door for the Passover, right? They put the door. This is why we call the, the chalice um, the, the blood of Christ right Christ's body and blood. I mean, the blood is the life force. Blood is, is, is sacred, it's holy, it's, it's, it's life-giving. You don't want to get a steak in Israel. They just, they cook it to death. And so, uh, so I'm, just, I'm just saying, it just, that's not what you eat over there. So, um, uh, so, blood, so this woman, for this woman to have a hemorrhage for 12 years means that she's literally, life is oozing out of her. And it's scary. I mean, it's as scary as a thousand demons in your head because, remember, she can also render you unclean. So she can't be near anybody. So not only, not only are you watching someone whose life is leaving them every day for 12 years, you can't be near her or you'll have to quarantine. So she's lonely and she's suffering. By the way, if you notice the, the word, the number 12, she had the hemorrhage for 12 years. The little girl was 12 years old. In many ways, it's the same story, right? Horror story which is another way of saying that we've all got something. I mean, these stories are about real people with real problems. And as I mentioned in my sermon this morning, I love to talk about the principle of repetition, which simply means that if God did something once, God will do it again. If God did something for them, God will do it for us. We don't just study this stuff because we're interested in history, although I think history is cool. We're doing this is because Jesus is in the stuff of their lives. Even the, even the horror stories, okay, God goes there. God goes there with them. And I love, there's a, there's a little clue or a tell in Mark's gospel that shows you that he goes there when he dips down into the Aramaic language. Talitha kum, little girl, get up. You know, there's no reason for Greek-speaking Roman people who are reading the gospel for the first time to know an Aramaic phrase unless, unless the gospel writer wanted them to know that this, these are real people with a real language and a real 10-mile arc where the fish are. 
You know, it's, it's, a real, it's a real place. It happened in time, in a place for them. And if you were to travel with me, and if you can't travel with me, I'm going to have you Don bring it to you next week. So we'll, we'll announce this again and again to make sure you know that Thursday week, he'll be here at 6.30 in the evening and then and in the men's Bible study uh, to bring this to you, bring this world to you. But if you were to go with me, you'll see whispers of these stories, just whispers. Just you'll see, you'll see the grassy hillsides where you can imagine that it happened. You'll see... Um, the ruins of Capernaum, they're there, little piles of rocks. There's even a column in Capernaum bearing the name of Zebedee, the family name of Zebedee, which tells you that the Zebedees were from Capernaum, you know, and, and so it was, the, you know, somebody's got to be from somewhere, and there's a Zebedee family, and two of them became disciples. It suddenly, it suddenly becomes real when you see that. Well, over the last few years, there have been, there have been things found that are not whispers, per se, but actually exciting, and I wanted to take a moment and, and show you, do a little show and tell, and then we'll see if we've got any questions. So over the COVID disruption for a few years, there were no tourists in Israel, which gave archeologists and people who you know, show people stuff for a living, either teach classes, teach at the seminary, or uh, take groups, uh, they had a little more time on their hands, and they found Bethsaida. Now Bethsaida is here on this side of the lake, but I wanna tell you that until uh, the summer of 2020 or thereabouts, uh, we didn't know where that was. What would happen? So some of you have been to Israel before COVID. This is what they told you. They would tell you, here's Magdala, here's Capernaum, here's where the fishes and loaves happened. And we think we know where Bethsaida is because we've crossed the Jordan, but they had, they had two sites north of here. And one of these sites dated before the time of Jesus and one of these sites dated after the time of Jesus, they'd be really clear with you. There's even a, still a, a street, a road sign that says Bethsaida, and it's, it's north of this site. But during the COVID disruption, they found it in the mud by the lake, just where, just where the Bible says that it was. So what you're looking at are the beginnings of an uncovery of the home of Peter and Andrew and, and Nathaniel, and it's a place where Jesus healed a blind man. I mean, this is it. Now, specifically, the way, the way that they found it it's kind of a cool, kind of a cool tale of, yeah, tale's a good word. A tale can be an artificial mound where you have an ancient civilization, but I'm using the word tales in T-E-L-L. -L. A good tale is if you can find a late Roman church. So what happened after Constantine in the early 4th century used Christianity as glue to hold the Roman Empire together. Uh, his mother, his mother um, Helena, was given a blank check and told to go down to... Uh, go down to the Holy Land and, and build churches, build, build churches for people to see things. And after that, the later Romans, who we call Byzantines, and that's, that's not a phrase they would know. They wouldn't, they wouldn't know what a Byzantine is. That's, that's what we used to describe them. They would call themselves Romans. These later Romans would take their, their building impulses, which before would have been used to build temples, say, to, to Diana or Apollo, Apollos or, or, or you know, to a pagan, to a pagan deity, and now use that, that impetus, if you will, to build monumental Christian structures, to build churches, something to go see. And we'll bring, um, this is going to be very important in just a minute. So what they found here in Bethsaida was a Byzantine church, and this is why we know where it is. Now, sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes a, a church is built on a traditional site or a supposed site, but this church called the Church of the Apostles, uh, we think is a tale uh, to let us know that beneath it, is right beneath it is the is the first century city of Bethsaida that Jesus knew. So that's it's kind of neat, and I got to see it the other day and kind of poke around and, and kind of, you can see the shape of a church. It's kind of shaped like St. Luke's with a long center aisle, and and it's just right where right where the Bible says it would be. The big story, though, in the in the ten mile arc of the lake where the fish are, the big story happened in two thousand and nine when this was found. Now, this was found in Magdala, which is right here on the far northwest corner. So they were building a beach hotel, actually a Dominican order of, of preachers in the Roman Catholic Church. They were building a beach hotel because, quite frankly, the Sea of Galilee or Canaret is somewhere where people go to the lake in the summertime. Uh, it, I won't take a group in the summertime for two reasons. One, it's very hot. It could be like 120 degrees in Tiberias, and, and it's not a dry heat. Uh, so it didn't, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't, yeah, Arizona guys, it's high as humid, like, feels like Montgomery. Uh, so, uh, so you're, so you're, you're here, first of all, you're sweating bullets, and then secondly, it's hard to really have a, 
devotional moment when there are jet skis all over the thing. And people just, <laughs> and then out comes the parasail, you know. I mean, people got vac- to have vacation too. And there's not a lot of water over there. And, and, so, and so, the, so, the, so the Sea of Galilee becomes kind of, yeah, it becomes a lake. And it's a, it can be a honky-tonk lake. Uh, but they're, they're, everybody's having fun. So you got the fishermen, you got the parasailers. Uh, and, and so anyway, they're, the, this Dominican order, they're building a hotel for, this, for the tourism business, for, for beach business. And they find what you're looking at. And that's a first century synagogue. And we know that Jesus prayed there. His sandaled feet touched that mosaic. Uh, he perhaps preached there and even perhaps healed there, which is really remarkable that you're looking at somewhere where Jesus stood, somewhere where Jesus prayed. Well, construction on the hotel halted. I mean, they just they stopped that immediately. They called in the antiquities authority, which is what you do. The government steps in. Uh, they began to authenticate and uncover, and what, that began a process. I, I, fortunately, I got to be one of the first people in public to get to see the darn thing in 2013. That's one of my first trip over there, and they just kind of opened it up, and they had a little they had a little uh, a trailer out there. It was an office, and you could go through a fence, and you could look at it and just set the world on fire. Well, fast forward to 2023, uh, it is now a major stop. In any trip to the Holy Land, it's a major it's a major priority. They've got parking for tour buses, and they've got it all laid out, and you can go see it and get close to it. Why why is this so important? Well, because until this synagogue had been found on this ten mile arc where the fish are, uh, we had not found a synagogue where we think Jesus would have preached before. Didn't didn't, didn't find one. Now we do have the ruins of Capernaum, which is in the middle. Sure, Capernaum is there, and Jesus Jesus preached in Capernaum, and that's that's his base of operation. But in the middle of Capernaum is a large fourth century Roman synagogue. It's monumental. Now I want to I want to tease your imaginations for just a minute. I want to remind you that when Constantine made Christianity the glue to hold the empire together, he gave his mother Helena a blank check to build things for Romans to go see. So when you go to Capernaum today, you see the ruins of Capernaum, and it looks like a little pile of rocks. Well, in fact, Capernaum also looked like a little pile of rocks when Jesus looked there. Uh, I mean, lived there. It was rocks and mud and flat roofs and smoke and not very nice, which is to say that Jesus hung out with really, really poor people. There is a, a major city on this side of the lake right here called Tiberias. Uh, that was built by Herod Antipas and was there when Jesus lived there. He could see it uh, during his ministry in the Galilee, but the Bible never tells us that he went there. Because Jesus didn't hang out in places of wealth and he didn't hang out in places of power. He hung out amongst poor fisher people, if you will, and, and Capernaum looked like a pile of rocks. So in the middle, in the middle of, this, of this, this, this village, if you will, this ruin, there is a marble synagogue and there there are probably two ways that tours or, or tour leaders will play this thing the first one is just the easy out which is to say this is the synagogue of jesus it just it just is i've been behind groups you know what happens especially if you're in the busy part of the season some of you've done this with me you got to wait for kind of a group to move through and so let's just say you got a group from, from texas and everybody's wearing matching t-shirts and the preacher's got a boy band microphone and uh, and he's coming on through and he says and it happened right here folks right here he healed him healed that old man demon out of his head he raised him up and everybody's just taking pictures and stuff going crazy and so and and of course he don and i are going it didn't happen and and so because it's a fourth century synagogue so what so what then the, then the second the second sort of prevalent i would say the prevalent story is that tour leaders will say um Friends, this is a second. This is a fourth-century synagogue built over the synagogue of Capernaum, and then you just leave it at that. Which means that the synagogue of Capernaum is beneath it, which makes Magdala, which you're looking at, so important because see his sandaled feet touch that. So you can't you can't know where the synagogue is underneath because even something from the fourth century, which would mean the 300s, is too valuable to to bust up, right? It's too valuable to break. Okay, that's the, that's the prevalent, I would say, sort of smart way to show this. But what I love about Edan is he does, a third, he does a third thing. And what he does is he shows you the ruins of Capernaum, and, and they, they are. It's a pile of rocks, very, very poor. And then you look at this, you look at this, this synagogue, this, this Roman synagogue, and it's made of marble, and it has Corinthian columns, 
and it's perfectly mortared and gorgeous. And I mean, it looks like it looks like something that you've seen in any Roman place that you've ever visited. It's very, very well built. And the, the fact of the matter is, is that the people of, of Capernaum didn't have the money to build something like this. They didn't have it in the first century, and they didn't have it in the fourth century. These are poor people, okay? They're scratching by catching African tilapia with little nets and selling them at market price. They don't have the means to build this thing. So why is it there? Embarrassment. I mean, just imagine if you're just a, a Roman, you know, Equestrian. I, I'm, I'm trying to imagine what, what kind of rich Roman I'd want to be. You know, one of the one of the praetors or something. You know, the senator uh, living in Tuscany, and I got a villa, and my wife is converted to Christianity, and so I'm sure I'm in. And uh, and then now she's about bothering me because she wants to go see where Jesus lived, and so I take my retinue, you know, and some slaves and banners and stuff. We all ride down to the Holy Land, and it's a pile of rocks, <laughs> and right there's nothing to see. And so so they built something so that Romans. You know, Romans, Romans like to do the same thing everywhere. You know that? They like every Roman. Have you ever been to a Roman place? If you have, then you don't need to see any more because you've seen it all. The Ro Roman world was like Applebee's. You get it. I mean, tell you, you get Bloomin' Onion in Fort Wayne, you get one in Birmingham. I mean, it's just, it's just everywhere you go, it's this, they, like, they like conformity. And so, so what, I'm, what I'm suggesting here, and this is a story for us, have we ever been embarrassed by the gospel? If we ever wanted to clean it up or pretty it up or make it look like something that we wanted to look like because maybe grace, maybe grace pinches some, right, or, or the truth of God is uncomfortable to us or maybe makes us feel ashamed or whatever happened. In other words, there's a really, really cool sermon right there in, in Capernaum because these Romans wanted to see something nice, nicer than what, nicer than what the Savior uh, did for them, which makes Magdala pretty much the story until until last year. So, again, we'd never, never found anywhere where Jesus had prayed, and then 500 yards from Magdala. So, so right here in Magdala, Northwest Shore, there's now a luxury hotel, tour, tour parking, olive wood souvenirs. You got it, man. It, it, it is it's selfies. You, 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 you could do, do anything you want to do there. And it's still something to see. I mean, it's, it's for real. Right across the street from here, 500 yards away, next to a roundabout, is this, and it's another synagogue. Now, we didn't know that they did this kind of thing, but we're still learning what first century people did, and we just figured that Magdala was of the size that, that, that the first synagogue they found would be the only synagogue. This also dates to the time of Christ, and it is less adorned. You can, you can sort of see the square where the elders would sit, so those are the benches kind of come out of there. So that's it's kind of going in a square. I tried to show, instead of a mosaic, they have flagstones, which means they don't have anything really fancy. There's no plaster, there's no flagstones. It's not, it's not really the, it's not really, you can tell it's not the mother church, right? And so there are two theories on what this, what this might be. The first one is that it's the poor synagogue for the poor people of Magdala. Well, if that's true, then where's Jesus going to hang out? Is he going to hang out with the rich people? Or is it going to hang out with the poor folks 500 yards away? I'm, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking now we're looking at where, where he would have prayed and perhaps would have healed and perhaps would have taught. I mean, that's the first theory. The second one, and I got a laugh out of this last week, but, and, but I'm, not, I'm really not kidding. The second theory is that it's a church split. <laughs> ah, yeah, it's a church. That's right. And so, and so what, I, what, what is suggested, and before we, before we go, <laughs> that's the split. Yeah, we, everybody does that. Uh, no, before we consider that, what, what, what the, the archaeologists are considering is that Jesus set this little world on fire. Remember, remember the story that we just read? The leader of the synagogue, Jairus, knelt, and knelt before Jesus. He has set this world on fire to the point everybody knows what's happening. Everybody knows they're catching the energy, they're catching the juice, and perhaps what you see here is another synagogue being started in the first century because they want to follow the teachings of the Galilean. What may be happening here is, is the earliest manifestation of the spread of the gospel. And that's pretty exciting. It's pretty neat to think about, right? And this, these are people who are actually considering this. Uh, I need to keep going with the story, and I'm watching my clock because i got one more story I want to tell you. It'll be paved over in two months. It's not going to be here. So for those of you going with me in May, it's probably, probably maybe it'll be out there. We'll sure, we'll sure, we sure hope to see it. But I have a feeling it's just going to be a nice widened road right over the thing because nobody wants it. 
Nobody wants it. I talked to the road construction guy who found it and who was awfully proud. And, um, and Edan was my interpreter. And, and Edan said that, yeah, he said he, he called everybody. Nobody wants, you know, across the street, they don't want it. They've already got one. What do we want another one for? And then the antiquities people, they, they, don't, have this, they don't have enough money to, 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 to uncover the things that they have. So what they're going to do, and somebody asked me this question, and this helps me to tell you, by paving it over, they can protect it. Oh, yeah, you were asking, why don't we just chop it up and bring it back to St. Luke's? We'll put it out in the garden. Uh, but, uh, and then last week, we also had a movement of St. Luke's after church. We're going to have a capital fund raise, and we're just going to buy it. We'll have, we'll, have a, we'll have another shrine across the street, St. Luke's Shrine, with really cool souvenirs. And, uh, but anyway, no, it, what, what will happen by covering it, it will protect it. It'll, 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 it'll still be there maybe one day for somebody who wants it. Isn't that like life? When God is right under our noses, we're busy doing something else. I mean, just we, 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 we think we're doing right, maybe. We're checking our boxes. We're staying in our lane, and God's just right over here, and we just, we just can't see it. Which brings me to another kind of another learning or another story, and then I'll, I'll, I'll see if I've got any thoughts or questions. So down in the, the south, of Jeru- south of Jerusalem, southwest of Jerusalem, so this Sea of Galilee is in the north of Israel. So down in the southern part of Israel, uh, going towards uh, Tel Aviv, going towards the coast, uh, there's a place called Bet Shemesh, and it's found in 1 Samuel chapter 6. In 1 Samuel chapter 4, to paraphrase, uh, the Ark of the Covenant was lost from Shiloh. Uh, the priest Eli's sons took the Ark into battle, and they lost it, which caused Eli to drop dead with just grief. It was horrible. Do you remember what the Ark of the Covenant was? It was a box that contained the Ten Commandments, which our children are learning about today in New Creation. It contained literally the tablets of the Ten Commandments and also the tablets that Moses broke. So the fragments and the, and the, and the second tablets that, that God wrote. And so it sat in shallow for many centuries, and they, they, they took it into battle, thinking it would be like a totem pole or a rabbit's foot, and they would win, and they lost the thing. And the Philistines had it, and they hot-potated it around because terrible things happened to them while they had it. And so they finally, they, they, they wanted no more. The lords of the Philistine city of Ekron, which is just a few kilometers from Bet Shemesh, put it on the back of a wagon and, and sent it home. You can read all, read all about this. But it, it stopped in a field of Joshua of Bet Shemesh, and you can go there today, and then there's a tell. So T-E-L now is a mound of an ancient civilization. Here's something I learned just a few weeks ago when I was over there. Tells stopped around the time of Alexander the Great. You, don't, you had tells until Alexander the Great. You don't have them anymore. You know why? City planning. I know, right? Finally, somebody had some city planning. They just start building on top of each other and uh, building every which way. You start having sewage and streets and you kind of laid things out. And so after Alexander the Great, you don't have those artificial mounds, but there are thousands of them in Israel. And every time you see a field with a mound in the middle, that just means it's an ancient city. So there's a mound. It's called Tel Bet Shemesh. And I don't have an hour to tell you this, but I'll just tell you, if you, if you thought you, you were seeing something when you saw the sandal, sand, imagine the sandal feet of Jesus on the mosaic, the Ten Commandments sat on this rock. It's the dimensions of the Ark of the Covenant. It actually sits now in a chapel that was erected around it. So it, they found it. They put it on this stone in the field of Bet Shemesh. And what happens, we read the scriptures, we, we know that it only stayed in Bet Shemesh for a little while, and then it moved on. It stayed at a place called Kiryat Jerry much longer. But I think this was a little like a Washington slept here kind of thing, in that they wanted to honor the fact that the Ten Commandments had been in a town. So there are sacrificial stones. You can actually see that. You see the black on the wall there, the, the, the um, horizontal kind of black stuff. That's from incense, from burning incense around that. You are looking at something that the Ten Commandments sat upon, which is will, will be, when it's open to the public, a national treasure for the nation of Israel and for the world. Very, very few Americans know about this. So, so I'm over here with my son. We're looking at this thing. This is a winter picture because it's got moss on it and some green around it. If you see it in any other time of the year, it's very brown and dry. And I've been, I've been several times. It's just kind of my cool, happy place to go to. And, and I've never touched it. I've, I watch Raiders of the Lost Ark. I'm not touching that thing. So, uh, so anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, sitting on the bench, and two, two, two tour buses ride up. And I thought, oh, crap. They've all found it now. Like this thing is the, the genie's out of the bottle, and we're going to have you know a luxury hotel next to it and and tour buses, right? And so the first bus gets out and they walk right by us, and we're we're sit, we're, we're sitting around in hushed tones talking about this 
this stone and what this means. And this group walks right by us to go look at a Byzantine church that's just over the hill. They didn't come for this. And then the second group came and they were talking about Samson which also happened in this part of the world. So they're telling Samson's story. But nobody, which is really fun, they're just walking by going, what are those, what are those yahoos doing uh, down there by that rock, right? And, they're, and they're, telling, they're talking about everything but that. Isn't it just like life? Isn't it just like God, that, that God is right under our noses with a surprise, with something more wondrous than we could ask or imagine, but we're just work, we're working our plan, we're... We're doing our thing, right? And, and yet God always wants more. So to conclude my part of that story, what we did is we just did this. We left. Because <laughs> I'm not ready for the world to find it yet, but I, 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 love showing you, I love showing you pictures. So a synagogue next to a roundabout, a stone upon which the Ten Commandments sat, a 10-mile ark, uh, a city coming out of the mud, just like the Bible said that it would. These are all whispers of the Gospels that we can find today. And... Uh, I'll, I'll turn the microphone off and see if y'all have any questions. Thanks, everybody.